Okay, so we are now live. If we could give it about a minute for everyone to be let into the webinar before we start the intro, that would and, be great. And you'll tell me when to start, right, Danielle? Yes, I can uh, send you a quick check, chat message. A chat message? Okay, if that's what I should be looking for. Um, okay. I think we have 50 people, um, which is pretty good. So it looks like the logins have plateaued, so you can probably go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Monroe County Bar Center for Education's fully active video. Today is February 25th, 2021, and this is Law Enforcement and Legal Immunity, exploring a complex problem from all sides. The program is hosted by the Academy of Law, the Lawyers Coalition for Racial and Social Justice and the Monroe County Bar Association. To comply with accreditation, if you're, if you're an attorney who's seeking CLE credits for this, to comply with accreditation regulations, please fill out your affirmation form and evaluation sheet at the end of the program and email them back to Danielle Matijas. In exchange, we will send you your certificate of attendance after the program via email. Please note, all attorneys must attend the program in their entirety to receive credits um, you have to, we are prohibited from issuing partial credits at two points during the program. I am going to be reading a code. You need to enter that code in your form to demonstrate to the uh, CLE folks that you have been listening and present at that point in the program. Finally, please note that everyone's line has been muted for the presentation portion of this session. If you have a question for the panelists during the program, please submit it during the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, you can also send comments or questions to fellow audience members or to the host for technical difficulties using the chat option. But, the, but you, uh, as I understand it, you can't actually chat with each other. Um, we're delighted to have everyone here. At the end of this program, all of our speakers have agreed to, in a more informal way than via the formal chat function, um, have agreed to make themselves available for up to a half hour after the program ends in order to answer questions orally. So if you have something that you wanna to address to any one of our speakers directly, stick around. Um, I, as I understand it, we're gonna ask people to individually raise their hands on that and and that's how we're going to handle that piece of it in the meantime during the course of the program if you have a question please put it in the q a and i it's my job to look for those q a's and um, relay those questions to the speakers i would like to thank our underwriters the modica law firm and cam holtz rossi plc thank you very much um, and at this point, let me get moving with the program. My name is Anna Marie Richmond. I'm going to be your moderator. I'm an attorney based in Buffalo, New York. My practice focuses on civil rights litigation. And I've been doing this kind of stuff for a very long time, excuse me. Um, we are thrilled and honored to have four very distinguished panelists with us today. Um, and I'm going to introduce them alpha alphabetically. Um, the first person alphabetically is Frederick Brewington Esquire. Fred is an attorney based in Long Island. He is a person who uses his law degree to do good. He has a distinguished 
background of, of litigation on behalf of people, civil rights plaintiffs. He has successfully challenged the at-large voting system in the town of Hempstead. Fred is, is one of those guys who uses his law practice for the greater good and we're thrilled to have him. Next alphabetically is John Elmore, who's an attorney of some 30 years standing in Buffalo, New York. John has a really interesting background for this panel. He has served as a police officer, state police officer before he went to law school. He has also been an assistant attorney general, a district, an assistant district attorney, and has done criminal defense litigation. So we have a very well-rounded panelist in John, John, I, I'm not going to even mention all of these gentlemen's awards. Look at their bios. They're, what an ex, what, how lucky we are to have these men with us. Our third alphabetical panelist is James Nobles. James is based in Rochester. He it does primarily, uh, he's a litigator. He does a lot of criminal defense work. He also has a background as a, a, an assistant district attorney and he is a person who represents people who are who are having their rights threatened by the government. Sometimes those people are government employees, and he'll tell us more about it later. And finally, last but not least, Steve Schwartz is a partner in Farachi Lang. He is a civil litigator who primarily concentrates his work in things like medical malpractice and toxic tort, but his pro bono career is distinguished by a lot of work on behalf of civil rights plaintiffs. So because these issues involve civil rights work, we have a, um, we have a program that enables us to understand how this case goes forward from a civil rights perspective. Um, now, I think I've handled all the housekeeping details. Um, we're going to start with an overview of, the, of criminal and civil litigation from, from Jim Nobles. So Jim. Thank you, Anna Marie. Um, so to give a little bit of background, my, uh, my career has been three years as an assistant district attorney and about 20 years uh, as a criminal defense attorney. As of late, just the last year or so, um, I have been more regularly and formally representing, um, in addition to the regular criminal defendants, police officers who have been charged with crimes either at work or outside of work. So I thought what would be really interesting for the group to hear is sort of how, in the context of this uh, panel, in the context of this presentation, how things move differently against police officers as they do against regular defendants. And if, if a police officer is arrested off duty in a DWI situation or domestic violence situation or uh, you know, a bar fight situation, the cases really proceed quite similarly as they do against regular defendants or regular members of the public. There is an arrest at the time of the offense. There would be processing and fingerprinting and booking and bail uh, arraignments, all of the things that normally happen that go from beginning to end, which can ultimately culminate with either uh, a trial, a dismissal, a plea bargain, whatever the case might be, just the way it would with a regular defendant. Where things get interesting for the purposes of this discussion is what happens when a police officer is alleged to have uh, conducted or engaged in criminal conduct while on the job. And what happens in those cases is very, very different because generally speaking, there's not an immediate arrest. There is not a booking or processing of the defendant. There is not an arraignment and a court appearance immediately thereafter or a bail determination. It, it, what happens is that these cases originate in a completely different way. They're either brought by a civilian complaint from someone who was arrested by a police officer who says, this person stole from me or beat me or did whatever the illegal conduct is alleged to have been. It could be started um, from an internal affairs perspective from that civilian complaint or from the complaints of other officers. Uh, it could come through the release of, of a video. In these days, every single person is now a videographer with their, with their cell phone in their hand. And we've seen that a lot where from around the country, there's bystanders or passersby 
who have recorded a potential incident that come to the attention of the police department, uh, internal affairs, the media, politicians that then call for an arrest or prosecution. Um, so civilian footage is often uh, part of that. Another part of that could be body-worn camera footage that gets released and analyzed. So these cases that come up where, where officers are facing potential criminal charges as it relates to something that happened on, uh, on duty often come out far after the fact often come out in a different uh, method in a different way. And because of that, the case proceeds very differently because the prosecuting agency at that point, whether it's the district attorney of that county or the attorney general of the state has the opportunity to do an investigation prior to the person actually being charged and arrested. Again, in a DBOI context, usually the person's arrested at the roadside and the case has already started before the DA has done their investigation. In these types of cases, the prosecuting agency has the opportunity to do a more thorough investigation, go out and talk to other officers who are at the scene, see if there's other video from the scene, um, whether that be from a store or a passerby, whatever the case might be. And I think it's largely to the credit of the prosecuting agency to do that, to sort of know what kind of case they have, know what kind of charges might be appropriate and know how they might continue to proceed. However, as I think lawyers realize that that might be a better way to start a case, I think lay people feel from the jump that police officers are being treated differently because they weren't arrested, weren't put in handcuffs, weren't fingerprinted and photographed, arraigned, had a bail determination, and then maybe are released or not. But the reality of it is the way that these cases come to light allow for a different type of investigation and a different type of process that is largely beneficial to the prosecutor to figure out what they have and how they wanna go forward with a case. But again, without sort of knowing that inside scope of how things work, I think from the community and from lay people, it just seems like these folks aren't being held accountable for what, what they've allegedly done. And I certainly can kind of understand how that works. Um, how these cases generally proceed from there is, uh, basically what they call a sealed case, which means it goes into the, the grand jury without the person having ever been arrested, processed, arraigned, whatever the case might be. Um, and that it, it becomes a much more complicated scenario at that point. Um, in the grand jury, what the grand jurors are designed to do as 23 people randomly chosen from the county is to hear evidence and determine whether there's reasonable cause to believe that a crime was committed and then after hearing the evidence and the instruction to the particular crime, make a determination whether or not the case should be a true bill, meaning that they've determined a case um, should be brought and charges, specific charges should be brought. And the case then would go forward in its normal fashion as with any other defendant, meaning uh, a, a new arraignment on what the grand jury determines, potentially a new bail determination because of the charges that are now pending. And, um, you know, discovery, motions, uh, motion practice, hearings, litigation, negotiations, potentially a trial, uh, an appeal, all the same things that would normally happen. But it's certainly a delayed start from what people expect. And it's a delayed start from what happens to regular folks who find themselves in the grand jury uh, decision. The grand jury is a critical part of the process. And I think oftentimes there are some rules that rightly or wrongly benefit police officers when they are um, being accused of crimes on the job in the grand jury process. Some are the same as what other defendants enjoy and some are very different. In any crime put before a grand jury, one of the things that has to be proven is the mental state that the defendant has to have. For instance, intent. So there are cases in which um, the question is, did this person intentionally strike someone or were they falling and was it an accident? That intent piece um, plays into both regular civilians as well, as well as police officers. And that is sometimes a very valid defense in a grand jury proceeding. It's rare for a defendant to testify in the grand jury, but in my particular practice, there's two types where I really try to follow through with a grand jury presentation. And I think it's often in the benefit of my client. 
And those two situations are where a crime has allegedly occurred and there is only two people there. One is the defendant and one is the witness. Because oftentimes, if grand jurors don't know who to believe in that scenario, you know, potentially you can use that to your advantage to end the case in the grand jury and find a dismissal there. The other one, which is even more powerful in my opinion, is where there's a self-defense or a justification defense. And those again, apply to police officers and regular citizens equally. But if someone is acting in self-defense under the rules of, of penal law and criminal procedural law in New York, it means they didn't commit whatever underlying crime it was. What we commonly think of in that scenario is potentially someone shoots and kills someone, but they say, I only did it because they shot at me first and I thought they were going to kill me. So those can be very powerful defenses in the grand jury and can end the case at that time. Justification also applies both to civilian defendants as well as law enforcement defendants. However, things get tipped slightly in the scale of law enforcement from there on, and one of which is justification in making an arrest. And there's a particular penal law section that says a police officer can't, in its penal law section 3530, which I've included in the materials, and the first section of it says a police officer can use physical force to detain someone for an arrest or to protect them from hurting themselves or someone else. Obviously, that doesn't always apply to civilians, but it does apply to, to law enforcement officers. And what's probably the biggest protection for police officers is a case called Graham v. Connor, which I've also included in the materials. Um, it is a U.S. Supreme Court case from 1990, uh, 1989, I'm sorry. And they go on to say what reasonableness is. And it, it's a fairly um, concise case, you know, maybe 10 pages or so, but it goes on to talk about what officers face, what's objectively, objectively reasonable and what they're facing. And I think it really um, summarizes with this in their quote, the reasonableness of a particular use of force by a police officer must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than with 2020 vision of hindsight. The question is whether the officers are acting objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances confronting them without regard to their underlying intent or motivation. The calculus of reasonableness must embody allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. When you instruct a grand jury with that instruction about a police officer using a use of force, I think that's a very powerful deterrent to a indictment coming forth against a police officer. Because I think if people put themselves in the shoes of that moment, whether they're struggling with someone who might have a gun or they're trying to take someone into arrest who's been fleeing from them for several blocks and running through traffic, it's hard to know what you would do in that situation. And when officers come in and say, this is what I did, and other officers came in and say, I was there, and this is what I would have done, or this is what I did, it becomes very difficult to get beyond that objectively reasonable standard. And, you know, that can be debated whether that's the right standard or not. But as we sit here today, that's the status of the law. And I think that's one of the reasons why it makes it so difficult um, to get an indictment against a police officer unless their conduct has been incredibly egregious. And so Jim, um, thank you very much for that introduction and that overview from the perspective of the criminal process. Um, the, the other piece of trying to hold officers liable is the civil process. And both, the, the, for, we're gonna focus on that very much in going forward. I'd like to, to turn next to Steve Schwartz, who's gonna give us an overview of what civil litigation looks like against any government official, but for our purposes here against law enforcement officers who are sued for damages by private parties. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, I'm going to uh, try to give you a, an eight minute overview of the civil rights statute and uh, constitutional law on that. And uh, Fred is going to really address a lot more of the uh, practical aspects of, of civil litigation. So we've kind of split up the topics that way. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now. 
And um, the first thing we'll start with uh, concerning um, 1983 is actual statute. So the 42 USC 1983 uh, was actually passed back in Reconstruction in 1871, and it was called the Ku Klux Klan Act at the time. And it was uh, intended to address uh, some of the horrors that were going on in the southern states um, with the uh, uh, collaboration in some sense of law enforcement. And uh, what the statute says is that every person who under color of state uh, of statute, ordinance, regulation or custom or usage of any state or territory or the District of Columbia subjects or causes to be subjected any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and the laws. So I underlined certain things here that are really important. Uh, person is important under color of state uh, of statute or what we call under color of state law is very important. And then the deprivation of, of constitutional rights or, or statutory rights uh, are the, the hallmarks of, um, of the Civil Rights Act and, and 42, 1983. Um, now, interestingly, again, that, that statute was passed in, in 1871, and it got very little play. Um, th there were very few cases that were brought under it, um, but that changed drastically in 1961. Uh, Monroe v. Pape uh, was a case that went to the Supreme Court, and the facts are, uh, I'll tell you, were that three, uh, 13 Chicago police officers broke into the plaintiff's home and made them stand naked while they ransacked every room. Mr. Monroe was then taken to the station where he was interrogated for 10 hours about a murder without being charged, arraigned, or given a phone call, and he was eventually uh, let go. Um, the, the defense on the case as to whether the uh, civil rights and, and 1983 applied um, was that they claimed that the officers were not acting under color of state law because they had no authority to do what they did. And what the court, uh, the Supreme Court held in, in Monroe v. Pape was that the officers were acting under the authority of state law, whether they were doing the, uh, what was appropriate under state law or not, and therefore they were liable under 1983. Um, so the officers individually were held um, that, that a, a claim could go forward against the officers individually. However, the Supreme Court held that, that a claim could not go forward against the city of Chicago because the Supreme Court at that time determined that the, the city of Chicago was not a person within the, the definition of the statute. Um, so that takes us to Monell versus Department of Social Services. And this was uh, 17 years later in 1978. And in the, uh, the Monell case, uh, a, a group of women who were uh, employed in, in two different agencies in the city of New York brought a uh, 1983 claim because um, the, the agencies had a rule of uh, making the, the women take um, unpaid leave at a certain point in their pregnancies, regardless of whether that was medically necessary. And um, they claimed they made a claim against the city of New York and the Department of Social Services. Um, and at that time, um, the, the, the Supreme Court uh, reversed itself on Monroe and held that um, municipalities could be held responsible under section 1983. So that was really a hallmark um, decision. Um, the next important decision was Owen versus City of Independence and that just came a couple of years later. Um, and this is a little out of order in my, my presentation so I probably should have put it later. But um, in addition to a municipality being held um, liable under the Manel case, the Owen case went a little bit further and said that um, that there was no immunity available. And we're gonna talk about immunity in a minute, but there was no immunity available to a municipality um, for the implementation or execution of a policy statement. So under Manel and under Owen, in order to hold a municipality responsible, you have to prove that the deprivation of, of rights uh, was, was caused by a policy or, or a, a common custom of the city or municipality uh, and it is not based upon what we know as respondeat superior or the uh, responsibility of an employer for the uh, torts of its, um, of its employees. Um, respondeat superior, superior does not apply to municipalities under civil rights statutes, but if the, uh, the actual action that deprives the, the person of their rights is a policy of the government, then the government can be held responsible. Um, 
So that takes me to the immunity doctrines. And we're going to talk quite a bit about um, the immunity doctrines under, under civil rights claims with regard to police officers. So I will introduce it now and we'll talk more about it as we get into the vignettes. But there are two types of immunity. We're actually the three types of immunity. The easiest one is the 11th Amendment immunity. So that would mean that under the 11th Amendment, the, the, you cannot sue a state unless the state allows you to sue it um, by granting some uh, waiver of that immunity. And, uh, and so civil rights claims cannot be brought against any state. They can be brought against the, uh, the employees of a state or officers of a state. And you see that quite a bit. Um, and, and for instance, all the prisoner civil rights cases are brought usually against the, the Commissioner of Corrections and, and various other uh, employees of the uh, Department of Correctional Services, uh, but you can't bring it against the state itself. Um, absolute immunity is also pretty straightforward. And for any acts that are, are, are uh, perpetrated by judges in the, in the, in the course of their uh, judicial roles or by prosecutors, as prosecutors, they have absolute immunity. So whatever your claim is with regard to civil rights, if it happened in a courtroom and you wanna sue a judge and a prosecutor, there will be absolute immunity from that claim and that will be dismissed. Qualified immunity is the much more uh, common immunity that comes into play in, in civil rights cases. Um, and it has various components. Um, the, the, the concept of, of qualified immunity is that uh, a person is immune from prosecution if, if they have a good faith basis uh, to believe that that they have not deprived anyone of their of their civil rights. Um, and the, it's an objective standard. It's not whether they believed it, it's whether it would believe. So it's a mixed question of law and fact for the court and for the jury in most cases. I wanna read something that, that I think will be apropos for what we're gonna talk about later. Uh, and this is from a case called Collado. Uh, which was a district court case, um, but uh, it was a case involving um, alleged exce excess, excessive force and the death of, uh, of an innocent person uh, due to being shot um, in, improperly. And the uh, court said the constitutional rights in question here were well established. So that's the first question is whether the rights uh, are, are established. And that's a legal decision the court has to make. But here the court said use of force is contrary to the Fourth Amendment if it is excessive under objective standards of reasonableness. And it says, and the use of deadly force is objectively reasonable only if the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a significant threat of death or serious physical injury to the officer or to others. And, and it goes on to say, in a case similar to this, the Second Circuit identified the inquiry as whether the officer's use of deadly force in self-defense was objectively reasonable, which would turn on whether there was an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others. And those issues with regard to reasonableness are jury issues. So the, the judge has to determine whether it's a recognized constitutional right that's been violated and whether a reasonable person would have known of that right but whether the right was violated and whether, whether um, it was a reasonable act is always a jury question. Um, now, <clears throat> I'll just move on to some of the technical aspects of the statute. Um, Section 1983 has no statute of limitations period uh, in it. So the uh, courts have interpreted as uh, applying the state law tort um, statute of limitations, which in New York would be a three-year statute of limitations. In a wrongful death case, it would be a two-year statute of limitations. Um, Section 1983 allows for monetary uh, recoveries, and that's what you hear a lot about, but also injunctive recoveries. So there are um, frequently civil rights cases that are brought to try to force uh, a change in policy or a change in action. Uh, and courts can impose injunctions to uh, enforce those uh, and, and change the law uh, or change the way that, that, that municipalities or other uh, entities working under state authority act. Um, the, the, it has to be a recurring wrong though. So there's, the standing doctrine is always around in any kind of federal case. So for instance, in a death case, it's very difficult to get any injunctive relief in a death case because the, the dead person is not someone who's going to be wronged again. And so in order to get injunctive relief, you typically need to have standing, uh, be able to, 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 to rightfully claim that this could happen again to you 
and therefore uh, the court can step in and, and grant equitable relief. Um, compensatory damages under Section 1983 um, are include but aren't limited to state law toward compensatory damages, including wrongful death damages. So New, uh, New York um, compensatory damage rules typically apply in 1983 cases, but they are not the limiting factor. In fact, there are a number of cases um, that hold that that uh, deprivation of constitutional rights allow for damages that go beyond what are permissible under state law claims. Um, and uh, one of those uh, categories, interestingly, is, is a, a, cat a category of damages called loss of life. So uh, in New York, as, as most of the lawyers that are listening at least know, um, death damages are, are uh, limited to the pecuniary loss or the monetary loss suffered by a family uh, the family members that are uh, interested in the outcome with regard to the, if they um, are, are either uh, wife, children, or other family members, depending on who survives. Uh, but in, in federal cases under 1983, it's been held in a, in a series of cases that the actual deprivation of constitutional rights that results in loss of life can result in a different category of damages, which have also referred to as hedonic damages. Um, but it's been likened to the, the um, in cases where someone is wrongfully imprisoned and has lost years of their life, um, the courts have, have likened that type of loss, in other words, the loss of, of the life itself. Um, and it's a very powerful additional area of damages that's recoverable, uh, or at least it's, um, it's been held to be recoverable in a number of cases. Um, punitive damages <clears throat> are also available. Um, uh, in the, the uh, Smith v. Wade case was it first held that punitive damages are available in 1983 cases, uh, but that is limited to the individuals in those cases and not to the municipalities. Uh, and it's been held that, that punitive damages or punishment damages cannot be uh, applied to um, against a municipality. Um, however, um, any, any kind of claim, and, and we're going to talk a lot about uh, police officers' claims, obviously, uh, in this, in this uh, CLE, um, there are uh, state statutes that require indemnification of police officers um, for any uh, actions or, or, or civil actions that are brought against them uh, in, uh, as a result of work that they do on duty. And uh, there, there are several different uh, general municipal law provisions that apply. Um, there, are, there are specific provisions that apply to New York City only, and then there's others that apply throughout the state. Uh, this one, uh, 50J1, applies to uh, in, in upstate New York. Um, and there's another provision within it that allows um, cities to, to uh, pass ordinances that provide additional indemnification release and also relief and also insurance. Um, I am going to, Steve, ask you to wrap it up because we have a lot to go forward. And Sure. And I will just add that there's also uh, a, a few cases that suggest that those indemnification provisions can even apply to punitive damages. Um, you can also include state law claims in your civil rights claim uh, under pendant jurisdiction under 1367. So you can claim, uh, you can plead a civil rights claim as well as uh, state law claims. And there are provisions for attorney's fees, section 1988, which was passed in 1976, provides that a successful attorney in a, for a plaintiff in a, in a 1983 action can apply to the court for attorney's fees. And that. A quick wrap up, thank you very much. We have okay. so much information to provide that I'm gonna be cutting all of these gentlemen off, I fear. Um, Steve has stopped sharing. Our next pres presenter is Fred. Go ahead, Fred. You need to unmute, Fred. All right, that's a little better. Yes. Well, good afternoon to everybody. And um, I, I thank the Monroe uh, County Bar Association for uh, allowing me to present this afternoon. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is some of the practical aspects and take you through some step-by-step -step things that practitioners might want to consider that are not only practicing with regard to their criminal practice, but also how it transfers over into the civil realm. Um, this uh, set of slides that we're going to start with starts with a, 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 some uh, screenshots taken from a video. 
uh, and I'm going to just have you take a look here. This is a police officer who, um, uh, and this gentleman uh, is a gentleman who was at a bar and one evening uh, there was a fight which took place. The fight took place and uh, involved not him or his friends, but other individuals. And those individuals happened to be white. The, this, our client is African-American and Hispanic. And um, they were waiting for their Uber ride to go home. And rather than go after the individuals who were engaged in the fight, um, went after my client and his friends who were just waiting on the corner and telling them that they needed to leave. They did move. And then they were chased further away, just saying that you can't be here. And then they began to record what was going on. Um, my client said, I know my rights. I'm going to record. Tell me your name. And at the time that he was told to tell, ask the officer to tell him his name, the officer said, if you, if you keep asking me that or if you don't leave, I'm going to arrest you. He said, I know my rights. Tell me your name and continue to, to video. Well, the officer then went behind him and put him in this bear hug that you see here suflexed him, for those of you who do WW um, uh, wrestling uh, stuff, and slammed him down on the ground. And my client did not know who this was that was had gone behind him, but uh, slammed him down on the ground, hitting his face, his head, uh, his shoulder, and other parts of his body. Um, and uh, though with regard to that, we immediately, when we got the case, sent out the reservation of uh, uh, preservation letters uh, to individuals, banks that were where there were video, so we could try and capture all that information. We've put sample reservation letters in the materials for you. Um, so this is what this gentleman looked like after um, being slammed into the concrete, not once but twice, because when he first was thrown down, he was trying to figure out what the heck happened. He got up and they slammed him down again. And as you'll see, we have injuries to his face and the next uh, slide gives you a better look of that side of his face. And then uh, the teeth that were knocked out, including the injuries that occurred inside his mouth that required stitches in his mouth. However, this sec segment is intended to try and tell you how important it is not to take things on face value. And I, that's not a joke at all. But in this situation, as he sat in the hospital, we learned that these injuries were not the major injuries that he suffer suffered um, because we went then and started to collect those injuries. He suffered a concussion um, and then a, a cyphoid uh, a bone, including but not limited to a uh, plate fracture in the face, TMJ injury, trauma uh, to uh, the fact that he was then knocked unconscious, um, uh, post-concussion syndrome, lacerations and cuts, injury to the right side, chipped tooth, injury to the wrist. But we then continued to dig because we then started to start to evaluate more. And we learned that his shoulders included, but not limited to a complex tear uh, of the posterior labrum. Um, and oblique injuries, horizontal injuries, because he was thrown down on his shoulder, it caused injuries to uh, other parts of his body, including um, tears to his shoulders and displaced um, uh, injuries. We then continued to do more digging. And these were the other injuries that then required not one, but two, and now needing a third injury. Why is this important? Both in the criminal case and in the civil case, important, we handled the criminal case which was completely dismissed. Um, and he was charged with a uh, resisting arrest um, uh, um, and the, the regular three, obstruction of governmental administration and, and disorderly conduct. Um, um, but those were all dismissed. Important for this case that, that we were able to collect all the injuries early on so that we can then make that part of our, our uh, advocacy um, in the uh, criminal matter. Okay, so this is a scary face because we're going to start to look at stuff that's really scary. Um, this individual was an individual standing on the street, uh, heading home actually after paying fines at a local criminal court um, based on his suspended license. And um, the long and short of it was that he, there was an officer that had a beef with him that, that, all, that this individual did not know. The officer went up to him and asked him some questions. When he said, I have no interest in talking to you, he started to walk away. The officer grabbed him and began to beat him. Other officers came on the scene and beat him to the po point where he was not only beat unconscious, but he was beat till his heart stopped, not once, but twice, and ended up in the hospital. He was charged with serious uh, uh, um, uh, uh, claims against the police officers who beat him with batons, as well as kicking him and beating him. 
uh, and uh, those charges were also dismissed outright, but he was still left with injuries such as this, that which you see on his head uh, being staples uh, and underneath, of course, were fractures. Uh, and this is what we asked one of the officers in a deposition or early on, did you see any injuries to that part of his head and, and that you saw in the picture? No. Uh, objection to answer. Can you answer it? You can answer it. No, I didn't. Um, and then we went uh, on. And by the way, this was consistent with all the officers that were present. They saw no injuries. They saw no injuries uh, with regard to him. This is the top of his head. Um, you see the uh, nine uh, staples uh, that are there. Um, and we asked the, uh, the officer, did you see him have any injuries to that part of his head at any time? I didn't see any. And the injuries that are identified in the back of the head and the right side that we just showed you, we asked this ultimate question. Can you explain how those injuries occurred? Every one of the officers said, I can't explain how it happened, which obviously for the civil case doesn't bode well for them in light of the fact that he was in their custody control the entire time, no less the false arrest, no less the malicious prosecution. So let's talk a little bit about civil rights uh, claims um, uh, and um, uh, how to sharpen your tool to dig and dig for things that will equip you to not only represent the individual criminally, but also within the civil case. In both and cases- Fred, may I interrupt you for one minute? I wanna give people the first CLE code. And so take a breath while everybody, while you're thinking about this, the first code for this CLE is 507. Two. Again, 5072. Thanks. I'm sorry for the interruption. Right. Not a problem. Uh, it, it, just a, a practice uh, um, note in both criminal and civil cases, the motion practice is key, uh, whether or not it's motions to compel, substantive motions to dismiss, or otherwise. And they also force both the prosecutor and the defense to place information out in front of you so that you can start to evaluate it um, rather than playing hide, hide and seek. Even with the advent of the repeal of 50A, which we're gonna talk about in a second, there is still quite a bit of information that is not being uh, uh, provided. And we just know the Second Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the repeal of 50A essentially uh, with regard to a New York uh, City case that was brought. So, um, but still the information becomes important with regard to the office's background and other information. Beware of the abyss of stipulation and waiver, both in the criminal and the civil case. What you agree to is what you're gonna be bound by. So when people ask you whether or not you're gonna to agree to stipulate to a certain thing, look behind that, whether or not you're gonna waive a certain right of your clients, because once it's done, it's done. And you don't wanna end up with, I wish I shoulda, coulda. Get the records and get certified records. Get all records, get police records when you get them, get every one of them. Try and get them certified upfront. If you can't do that, get them certified after get all the medical records promptly. The medical records tell a very, very good story that may not be able to be articulated by your client in the criminal case and in the civil case, but also getting them certified early oftentimes helps because when you're getting ready for trial and you're preparing always for trial is our view uh, in my office, um, you wanna try and get those things that would be utilized uh, and helpful in overcoming any, any evidentiary objections. Identify your client's injuries, help him or her sup uh, get support because many times they need medical treatment. Many times your clients are not being able to get the medical treatment. How can you find uh, the, the providers that will do that? Psychiatric treatment, uh, financial impact from the arrest and prosecution is things you're gonna deal with as well, as well as other damages that they're suffering with regard to the impact on their family, their jobs and otherwise. Be prepared to talk about that with them. Don't let it uh, crop up uh, as a result of it being a surprise because these things are reoccurring in cases such as these. Um, expanding um, uh, the, your uh, uh, information for later. Remember in civil rights suits, there's a potential for both federal and state claims. And we heard that um, uh, uh, early on. Um, so you may uh, uh, bring them, they're potentially separate and distinct, but uh, there are theories that may separate them, but they oftentimes overlap but you should wanna bring your entire arsenal of claims um, into the courthouse, whether or not you're in federal or state uh, uh, court, 
Um, I, I prefer a federal court because of the um, discovery uh, that you're entitled to, as well as the fact that judges are used to handling 1983 cases. So protect your client's rights and advise her of those rights. That's important. Choices. State court, court claims, fill the requirements. Notice a claim and we have um, and you'll see in a second that, that, that we have a, a slide that talks about providing you with a sample notice of claim. Um, and these are some of the potential uh, issues after you file your notice of claim, which must be filed within 90 days of the wrongful act. Um, um, this is, uh, the, which may be different for different claims. Malicious prosecution after the determination, it has to be a determination on the merits in your client's favor. False arrest, excessive force and defamation, for instance, the timing is important and important to understand uh, that you know, filing the notice of claim um, in a timely fashion allows your client to have more options and choices with regard to uh, the claims that they may want to bring. No sample notice of claim is in the materials and we encourage you to take a look at those. Advise your client in criminal cases about what their rights are, the right to file a notice of claim. Tell them the time limits uh, and diary so that you continue to inform them. If you're not handling the civil case, let them know that they have those rights that they should seek other help and try and get them that help. Consider if there appears to be a viable claim so you can provide them with ample opportunity to know what they need to do and have a right that they have a right to commence an action. Don't let your clients um, be in a situation whereby your failure to tell them what some of their rights may be, you're committing malpractice. If there's going to be a 58 hearing, and we told that we saw General Municipal Law 50 was mentioned earlier, if the criminal court case is still pending, remember that they have a Fifth Amendment right and that this is what we have our clients um, uh, read if indeed they have to appear for a 58 and it cannot be adjourned that they in this situation uh, will then uh, be able to say that they refuse to answer the question uh, based on the advice of counsel and that they're uh, asserting their rights. This cannot be used against them in the civil case. They have an absolute right to assert their Fifth Amendment right and it is not something that can be used against them. Section 1983, let's talk about that. There's no notice of claim requirement for the federal claims, but they still do go hand in hand uh, with uh, the New York State uh, claims. And under Section 1983, as was mentioned before, we borrow from the state that you're in. And in New York, those claims are usually governed by a three-year statute of limitation. Uh, where is a dismissal not a dismissal for malicious prosecution? And how do you know? Well, uh, malicious prosecution requires a determination on the merits in the favor of the the plaintiff. So an ACD or an ACOD, depending on where you are in the 17, uh, excuse me, 170, 55 um, is um, a, a problem. Um, uh, why? Because it's not a determination on the merits. Interest of justice dismissals can be a little bit more tricky and depends on what the record says. And 3030 motions also, um, the law is uh, out there for you to take a look at. So here's some of the cases. An essential element of a malicious prosecution claim is that the prosecution terminate in some manner indicating that the person was not guilty of the offense charge. In other words, terminating in their favor based on the merits or something would be, be, to be considered the merits. And uh, we, we'd advise you to take a look at Singleton versus the city of New York and the citation is here. Um, and that case is instructive to help you understand uh, when is your malicious prosecution claim uh, in your favor and not. Disposition of an adjournment and contemplation of dismissal is not a favorable termination for the purposes of maintaining a malicious prosecution claim. We ask you to take a look at Murphy versus Lynn, uh, uh, 118 F3rd 938. Um, very, very good in, in instruction there. You should know this if you're going to do 1983 litigation. And also, if you are a criminal uh, uh, law, uh, uh, legal, uh, advisor for, for a client, you want to make sure that you're making decisions and that client knows that if indeed they take, for instance, a, uh, uh, a German contemplation of dismissal, that they may be giving up the claim of malicious prosecution. And then interest of justice. There, this is a mixed bag. So there are cases that talk about that it, it cannot provide the favorable termination required for the basis of a malicious prosecution claim. And these cases will help you understand 
that uh, area of law, the, the Lanning case uh, and the High case, um, but also there's a flip side of the coin. A termination in the interest of justice may nonetheless be favorable. However, where dismissal was based on a proffered evidence that conclusively supported a claim of innocence, that's what you were looking for. And in Hankins, uh, you want to take a look at that. Take a look at what is happening in that interest of justice. And for instance, if the prosecutor says we're going to dismiss in the interest of justice, you need to make a record and say that, Judge, no, there is evidence which supports that this claim uh, uh, it, uh, supports my client's innocence, so that you can make that record in case that is raised later on concerning your malicious prosecution claim. It is your record as well as the prosecutor's record in that situation, and you should grab a hold of it and make it for your client. Speedy trial, 30-30, and there have been determinations, but in large part, 30-30 determinations can be and oftentimes should be considered to be uh, in the favor of the uh, accused. My final slide. All this is a lot, but it also does not require you to be a superhero. Uh, it does require you, however, um, to uh, make a determination um, as to uh, how you can best serve that particular client, how you can best serve that uh, client uh, in a way that uh, their information is going to be made available to them and give them everything that they need so they can be educated consumers. So they can make determinations for themselves with your support. All right, I thank you for the time. Uh, and I also appreciate the fact that uh, we've had the opportunity to try and piece these things together because both James and Stephen's uh, um, uh, uh, presentations, I think help complement what we just went through. So thanks so much, Anna Marie. Thank you, Fred. And now we're gonna turn to John Elmore. John, what I did not tell you when I was introducing him has been instrumental in the city of Buffalo in working um, with the Minority Bar Association's Criminal Justice Task Force to propose policy changes in the form of le uh, legislation and changes in, in how the police are functioning in the city. I hope he's gonna talk to us a fair amount about that. John, I'm gonna ask you, there is a question pending. If you can answer this at some point during your presentation, do so. The question that was presented was, do police on duty charges always go to the grand jury? The person who asked the question says he thinks that that or he or she thinks that that leads to a secret determination which may give the prosecutor cover to say that they tried but the grand jury said no charges. So if you can address that, do. If you can't, I'll ask somebody else later. But thank you. Certainly. Well, if, if, if there is um, a potential of a felony, it has to go to the grand jury. Uh, it, is, it is rare for the uh, for there to be an, an arrest of a police officer, as, as Mr. Noble stated earlier, um, when when there's it's it's very rare for the only way that the prosecutor can make a determination to bring a, a police officer to justice is to present uh, is to present the case to the grand jury. Uh, the prosecutor cannot um, arrest the police officer, but if he gets an indictment. Then, then, then there would be a, a, a warrant for the police officers for his arrest. If anybody else wants to chime in that, but it's very, uh, it's very rare uh, that a police officer is is uh, charged with a crime without the case going to the grand jury uh, first. Yeah, I would I agree with John uh, with regard to anything that rises to the level of a felony. Um, uh, in some cases, there have been felony arrests uh, that have gone to grand jury, but very few. But misdemeanors. Almost certainly, I have seen some arrest of police officers on misdemeanor charges that don't necessarily have to go to the grand mm -hmm. jury. But I've also seen DAs duck that issue and present misdemeanor claims to a grand jury and say the grand jury made the decision. Certainly. And let me just say something about uh, grand jury. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've been a defense attorney for, for many years. Uh, I don't do as much criminal defense as I used to now. But whenever I wanted to put a defendant in front of the grand jury, I always waited until the end of the grand jury term. You need a quorum of 16 grand jurors uh, in order to present a case, and you need 12 to get an indictment. The grand jury is consisting of 23 people. So if, if there are 23 people in the grand jury and, and you want to put your client in, and there's, then you're going to need 11 jurors, uh, or actually 12 jurors, 
uh, to get the charges dismissed. But if there's 16, you only need you only need five. And oftentimes, uh, in the beginning of the grand jury session, you have 23, and then near the end, sometimes grand jurors get sick or they can't make it. They have work complications, and and you're you're near the end of the grand jury term, you're going to have uh, oftentimes fewer grand juries and, and, a, and a much easier time to get a dismissal. So I have, I've always tried to schedule my client's testimony as close to the end of the grand jury process as I possibly could. And oftentimes, um, uh, part of the case could be presented in the beginning of the grand jury and then part later. And so if there are any grand jurors that didn't hear the whole um, presentation from when the prosecution put their case on and then when your client takes the stand, they can't, um, they can't vote as well. So you're gonna get a fewer number of grand juries. Um, I, I'm fortunate to have been uh, one of three chairpersons of the Mar Minority Bar Association Criminal Justice Reform Task Force. And uh, we've been very, very, um, um, very, very, we've had some very good success in advocating laws, we uh, law changes and police reform. Um, one of the things that we were, we were successful in is getting Cario's law passed um, as a, and signed into law by the, the city of Buffalo mayor. Cario's law is a duty to intervene. So in other words, when a police officer uh, sees his partner or other police officers doing something using excessive force, they have a duty to intervene. Um, we did this uh, by, by uh, getting a lot of community groups involved. Uh, there was a group called the uh, uh, Stop the Violence Coalition, another group of, of Concerned Clergy of Western New York, the Urban Think, Think Tank. Um, we presented um, our thoughts and concerns to these groups and we had a press conference. We testified in front of the uh, council about the need for it. And, and, and eventually uh, it was passed. Um, another success that we had um, was after some of the protests this summer, our, our mayor signed legislation saying that police officers did not have to wear uh, name tags or, um, or badges. Um, and they, the, the rationale was behind the, the, that change or, or that administrative directive was that some police officers that were involved in protests and arresting protesters were being harassed on the internet. So, so the mayor, without going through the police advisory committee, which was set up to uh, approve any changes in, in legislation or police um, rules and regulations, um, he just went around that and just came up with an executive order saying that police officers do not have to wear badges or name tags. They just had a random number on their on their name tags. And so we felt that was very inappropriate. Uh, we um, drafted, actually drafted legislation for the council to consider. Uh, we had a press conference. We got all of our groups and, and, and other bar associations uh, to adopt that. And, and uh, that executive order uh, was withdrawn. Um, we're one of the, one of the, le the uh, legislation's um, initiatives that we have pending is a right to no law. Uh, Syracuse and New York City have a right to no law that says that when a police officer stops you, he has to tell you why you're being stopped. He has to give you a card that has his name on it. Uh, where you would file a complaint, uh, and and then the uh, uh, the jurisdictions has to keep statistics on the stops, including the race of the person that was stopped, the reason that they were stopped, whether or not uh, the person was issued a, a ticket, um, and and we think that's very important because oftentimes when a citizen has a confrontation with a police officer, they're stopped by the police officer, and they ask the police officer for the name or for the badge number that escalates the situation. You ask a police officer for his name or his badge number and it often makes the police officer think, well, this guy's a, being smart. He may file a complaint against me, so I'm just gonna lock him up. So uh, with the right to know law, uh, that, that avoids that. And, and we, we looked at New York City's right to know law. We looked at Syracuse's right to know law. Um, 
our committee, which was made up of members of the Minority Bar Association and the Erie County Bar Association and, and, and others, uh, submitted to the council proposed written legislation. It wasn't a situation where we just said, you know, write a law or draft a law, but we actually gave them the law in draft form. And that, um, that has been tabled, um, but um, many of us, in, including members of the clergy, members of our bar association have all testified in front of the council legislative committee. And even though it's been tabled, we made a request to speak to the, uh, the common council uh, next month. So, um, you know, we're lawyers. Uh, we, we wouldn't be participating in uh, the CLE if we didn't believe that there's a need for criminal justice reform, for police reform. And, and I, I urge all of you uh, to, to look at, uh, at what we've done in Buffalo and, and make a difference. Um, and if I could just, just make a, a couple other comments about just a couple of things that uh, some of the other speakers um, um, talked about. Um, I just like to talk about choice of forum. If you have uh, a, a complaint of civil uh, rights abuse, my choice of forum because of where I practice law in Buffalo is state court over federal court for a couple of reasons. In Western New York, the only urban court is going to be in Erie County, which is which encompasses Buffalo. You're going to get in Cattaraugus County. Uh, in Wyoming County and Genesee County, which is in the 8th Judicial District, uh, those are counties that are going to have less than 1% uh, African Americans or, mi or minorities in it. So you're going to have a much better uh, jury veneer in state court than you will in federal court. And then in, in state court, you're going to have an opportunity to, to question the jurors during voir dire. And so when you know that a, that, that a, um, a, a juror is really right-winged, really conservative, but uh, um, you know, there's ways that you can get that juror challenged for cause if, if you're questioning him himself, whereas as, as oftentimes in federal court, the judges aren't really going to try to get a juror out for cause. And so I, I find state court to be the, uh, the best forum. Um, and then thirdly, um, when it comes to qualified immunity, um, that's a tough thing to, 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 to get over. And if you look in, in my materials, uh, you'll see a, uh, a motion for summary judgment, which uh, 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 the prosecutor, the, the police made to uh, dismiss on the issue of qualified immunity. And one of the things that I did early on was to get a police expert. Uh, a uh, guy by the name of Walter Signorelli, who was uh, uh, who had a law degree. Um, he worked in internal affairs for the New York City Police Department. He was uh, trained in defensive tactics, taught at the police academy, taught at John Jay College. And he was able to look at the police manuals for the city of Buffalo, look at the procedures. He understood the law and he was able to successfully uh, assist me. Uh, in preparing for depositions of the police officers, and, and we were able to, def to defeat that. So uh, I suggest everybody early on uh, that you get, get one of the best experts. I found him to be very, very good to uh, assist me and to defeat that, uh, that motion to dismiss for qualified immunity, because uh, if you can point to police procedures in the manual and, and just general police practices with an expert, then you, you can, you can um, overtake that. And another thing about um, federal court too, because I've had cases in federal court where, uh, where the uh, police department uh, uh, attorneys or the city of Buffalo attorneys uh, filed uh, a motion for dismiss on qualified immunity. And that, 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 um, that gets appealed. And when it gets appealed, um, I have to fly to New York City to, argue the case in the second circuit, which, which is expensive and, and, and it's a delay as well. So that's another reason why I, my preferred jurisdiction is state court over federal. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, we have uh, one more question that has been presented. And what, what we had hoped to do with this group was to present a couple of 
different scenarios and, and allow the panelists to comment on them. These are, these are real facts. So I'm going to tell you, gentlemen, that the question is, what does thoughts, does anyone have thoughts on excited delirium as a condition? That's just out there. If somebody wants to tackle it, you can. But let me give you a, a vignette, which some of you may recognize depending on how much attention you pay to the news. Uh, on June 4th, 2020, municipal police responded to a peaceful Black Lives Matter demonstration in Buffalo where many hundreds of citizens were present. The police were wearing riot gear and had shields and they began to clear the area in the city central square at the beginning of a curfew that had been announced. An unarmed elderly protester, a man, approached the phalanx of oncoming police as they moved in front of city hall. The officers continued moving forward in formation. The officer nearest the protester pushed or bumped against him, causing him to stumble and fall to the ground. He hit his head on the concrete. He began to bleed from his ear. A second officer broke ranks to kneel toward him and was pushed, sort of shooed back into line by his supervisor. The protester was hospitalized for a month with a concussion and other injuries. The two officers were suspended without pay that night. The local district attorney charged them with second degree assault, which is a felony. Um, and February 11th, the grand jury in Buffalo voted not to indict. So I've got a series of questions, gentlemen, and I'm gonna just sort of go round robin. Um, what is the significance of the decision to charge a police with a felony rather than a lesser crime? I'd ask either John or Jim to answer that one. Could I, could I just say um, this might be the appropriate time to, to play the, um, the video of what happened as well as my commentary? Well, then you won't get to talk after that, but yes, we will pay you a okay. minute video and then All Jim right, will, will talk. Okay, right. um, Danielle, if you would play the video. Attorney John Elmore joins us tonight to discuss this. Uh, Counselor, thanks for your time tonight. First and foremost, your reaction to uh, what the district attorney had to say today, which cleared the two officers. I'm not surprised. It would be very difficult to convince 12 jurors beyond a reasonable doubt if you cannot convince the 23 grand jurors uh, that there was probable cause to believe that a felony was committed. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to prove what an officer's state of mind is. In, in this case, the district attorney would have had to prove that the officer's intent uh, was, was to cause physical injury. Uh, if you look at the tape, you'll see that Mr. Guan, Guagino was a peaceful protester, but if you look at his hand, it was reaching towards the officer's belt and, and, and the officer's state of mind may have been that I need to protect myself because this guy's hand is near my gun belt. And, and he may not have attend, intended to, to hurt or injure Mr. Grigino, but he just may be focused straight ahead uh, on trying to control a peaceful protest that had the potential of becoming a not peaceful protest. And let me ask you about the charges. Uh, they were, the, the charge was a felony. Do you think that the district attorney may have overcharged this case, having it be a felony? Well, the, the district attorney has the obligation to present to the grand jury the highest possible charge that he believes is provable. If Mr. Flynn, based upon their investigation, felt that that was the highest provable charge of felony, then he had an obligation to present the, the, the grand jury for their consideration felony charges, but the grand jury should have also been properly charged lesser included, uh, the, the lesser included charge of assault in the third degree, which is a misdemeanor. We don't know if that happened. Local defense attorney, John Elmore. John, thank you so much. We appreciate your time tonight, sir. So Jim, I'm gonna um, ask you to comment uh, as well on the question of the significance of the decision to charge a felony, but I'd also ask you to, uh, John's given us some suggestions about why the, why the officers, maybe the grand jury thought the officers didn't commit a felony. If you have any additional thoughts on that, would like to hear it. And if the district attorney had sought an indictment for a lesser crime, do you think the outcome might've been different? 
That's a great question. And first of all, I, I, I support everything that John said and would have answered that the same way. Um, I think what is required here is a little bit of knowledge of the penal law and what makes an assault in the third degree an assault in the second degree. The difference between those two, assault in the third degree being a misdemeanor, it requires the intentional infliction of physical injury. Assault in the second degree requires the intentional infliction of a serious physical injury. Without getting too much into the definition of what that means, this gentleman's injury, having been in the hospital for a month would certainly qualify as having been a serious physical injury. But the issue of whether the infliction of the injury was intentional or not would be the same as it relates to the felony or the misdemeanor. So in this case, I can understand why the district attorney chose to present the felony of assault in the second degree because the injury was there, but the question is, was it intentional or not? The other piece that the district attorney may have been deciding in, in making this determination is on a misdemeanor, the case can get all the way to a trial on a criminal complaint, meaning a signed complaint. There is no function of, of the grand jury to uh, ferret out the facts and circumstances of a complaint on a misdemeanor action itself. So if this was charged originally as a misdemeanor, the district attorney's office may have been forced all the way to a jury trial. Now with the burden of proving beyond a, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that this was an intentional act. And if they couldn't meet the lower threshold of reasonable cause to believe that the defendant had a criminal intent, there's no way they're gonna do that in front of a jury. So I think for both reasons, both the, the facts of how this came out with the injury as well as had they charged a misdemeanor alone, they could have been forced to do this publicly in front of a jury in, in, in court uh, and probably, well, certainly if they can't get an indictment from a grand jury, they weren't gonna get a conviction at trial. I think you're muted, Anne-Marie. Thank you. I'm gonna to go to Steve with our next question, but before I do that, I'd like to give folks the next viewing code for the CLE. The second code for today's CLE is 9029. Again, 9029. Steve, looking at the video and what you know about this case, if there's anything more than, than we've told you, do you think the protester has a potential claim against the police officers for excessive force as a civil case under section 1983? I think he does. Um, it won't be an easy case. And I think the, the qualified immunity issue is going to come up here. Um, you know, reasonableness under the circumstances is going to be based both on the outcome, but also on the act. So this was not a deadly force case. He, he did not, um, he did not hit the, the protester with a, with a baton. He did not shoot him. Uh, he did not tase him. So he pushed him clearly. Uh, and the question is going to be whether whether that is an unreasonable act under these circumstances. And that's going to be a, um, you know, a difficult issue. Um, obviously, the outcome uh, was horrendous, but because it was a push uh, and not, um, you know, not some more excessive force, it's going to be a difficult excessive force case, I would believe. Thank you, Fred, your question. What hurdles is this protester likely to face if he attempts to bring a civil action for damages against the police officers? Well, there are going to be several hurdles. Uh, you're going to first, it's probably going to face a motion to dismiss right off under 12B. Um, and a 12B6 motion or 12B1 motion is going to be made concerning the pleading and whether or not uh, at that point asking a court to uh, uh, stop the case using qualified immunity. That's going to come about uh, right away, as well as other challenges to the complaint. Uh, they're going to get. Uh, there's going to be challenges to, with regard to discovery uh, throughout the entire case, and whether or not you're in federal court or state court, uh, you're going to have those hurdles. Um, and then you're going to file. You're going to have. Uh, you're going to need to file motions to compel throughout. Um, because the reluctance for governmental agencies to give the documents that you should give has been consistent. Um, and then you're probably going to be facing a, a summary judgment motion uh, at, at the end of it. So there are going to be a number of hurdles. These cases are not easy. These cases are not for the faint of heart. And uh, John Elmore actually said, uh, just, you know, Mr. Signorelli and I, I started him on his journey. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, whether I, I know that. 
Yeah, um, but but the, and having a good expert and people to work with you extremely important. So the answer to the question is going to be quite a few hurdles, as well as the emotional roller coaster for the plaintiff um, going through this. So I'm going to ask you. Someone uh, put in an interesting question that I'm going to ask you to address, Fred. And then, if you want to talk about briefly about excited delirium, I'll ask you to do that too. So the question that came through was: Does a police officer's defense that I was following my training eliminate any possibility of demonstrating a intent? It is. It certainly doesn't help. Um, and when you start dealing with issues of qualified immunity and what the officers. Uh, not only intent was, but all, also what they knew and did not know and what they believed to be a violation uh, of the constitutional rights of the individual. It starts to run into the judges being able to make certain determinations based on the law. Um, so uh, it, it, it certainly, let me just put it, it certainly doesn't help. But that's one of the reasons why you've got to get into the training. You've got to get into the the, uh, uh, the curriculum uh, that's taught um, to officers. And in the depositions, you've got to dig and you've got to dig hard uh, to go after those issues, to know that you're going to be facing qualified immunity at some point and prepare to get around it using deposition testimony. Um, with regard to excited delirium, um, for those of you who don't know what that is, that is a uh, medical, quasi-medical term. How's that? Um, that has been made up um, by largely been so supported by Taser International, um, uh, where they basically have tried to create and have doctors say that when a person gets tased um, and they are tased, that's the term, uh, that, that the injuries that they receive, particularly in death cases, was not a result of them being tased, not a result of them uh, of them have their systems in, impacted by the, the taser weapon, um, but that they scared themselves basically to death. Um, and that it was based on a delirium and excitement that they caused themselves into a frenzy. And let me give you one quick example and then I'll get off it. Um, we had a case where a gentleman was tased uh, nine times. There were 18 taser burns on his body. Um, he was tased in drive stun as well as in the barbs, and they claimed that he, he basically scared himself to death. Um, well, the reality is he most certainly would not have done so had he not been tased. Um, <laughs> and, and whether or not, and, and we call that Mars, um, multiple applications in rapid succession, the drive stun. Um, and as a result of that, his system was beat up regularly over time over and over again his uh, pulmonary system his his respiratory system his cardiac system and as a result of that he did die but it wasn't from excited delirium it was as a result of the uh, injuries that he sustained but taser has fought these uh, um, these battles uh, very uh, hard um, and excited delirium is a very much a debated issue um, in these cases you're muted, Anne Marie. One of our one of our guests, Dr. Gail H A R R, has uh, indicated to us that that diagnosis, of the excited delirium, is not recognized Recognize by it. the psychiatric experts or by in the DSM five. She's um, absolutely right. Yeah, and it's definitely something that you could challenge under a Daubert challenge for sure, and and should be if it's in your case. Absolutely. Okay. So I, we have, we're running out of time for the scenarios, but I wanna give you guys the other one. Um, so the police respond to a call from a local grocery store that someone is stealing bread and other things. The store owner doesn't report that the perpetrator used or displayed a weapon. He's just grabbing stuff and leaving. The police arrive in time to see the 18 year old suspect still in view. He was fleeing on foot. He was unarmed. The police shot him in the back and he was paralyzed as a result. First question, can the police officer who fired the shot be charged with a crime? And if so, what crime? Um, Jim, can you tackle that one? Absolutely. Uh, yes, he absolutely can be charged with a crime. Um, and it, it could be as significant and likely would be as significant as murder. Um, you know, we talked about the standards of justification and, there, and justification comes in a variety of different components. One would have to be that um, the, the officer believed that he or someone else's life was in danger 
at the time he took the fatal shot or took the shot. Um, and realistically, with a suspect running away from him uh, without any articulable facts that appeared to be, you know, a firearm or shots fired or anything in that regard, uh, justification would not uh, be a successful defense uh, in, in that. Secondarily, I spoke briefly before about Penal Law Section 3530, which is the justification for use of force in making an arrest. And what's different here than what we spoke about before was that this isn't just the use of force, this is the use of deadly physical force. And that has to, in order to do that, you have to have some additional requirements to be able to use that, um, you know, where it's, it's a felony with the attempted use or threatened use of physical force against a person or a kidnapping, arson or escape, um, that the offense was committed by such a person that was attempting to escape custody with a fire firearm or deadly weapon. I mean, any of the exceptions that would allow this type of use of force are not involved in this particular vignette or hypothetical. Um, this is a case where I would expect uh, an officer to be uh, indicted and, and likely convicted of some level of homicide. Um, you know, it, it, they may determine it wasn't an intentional murder, but it was an intentional assault first or a man two or, or, or a man one. Uh, there are a variety of charges that would likely be charged. And I would guess that a conviction would be sustained on some level of homicide. Hmm. Um, John, I'm going to ask you, can you, assuming that it's permissible under some circumstances to use force in the context of an arrest, can you comment on what constitutes excessive force? You're muted. All right. I just, I just had to change locations because I have a contractor in my house. So excuse me. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so he's just hammering it away. Um, police officers are trained to use a continuum of force. When you you should first try to verbally get a person to comply, and and the last you would use at the other end would be deadly physical force. And and um, you know one one thing I think that's always important though is is that once a person is handcuffed, the the use of force. Uh, should stop and, and, and often two times all too often you see people that are handcuffed and, and it continues and once once a person is under control uh the force the use of force should should stop so when somebody's on the ground uh, and they're no longer a, a danger uh then then the force should, should should stop but there's a continuum should start with verbal com commands uh and as long as the person is not doesn't have a weapon uh, you have other tools. You have uh, uh, um, you have your nightstick. You have pepper spray. Uh, you have uh, uh, you know the little electrical thing that gives you shocks. I forgot what the, the but 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 it's a continuum, and and uh, you shouldn't use any force that's more than necessary to get the person under control and under arrest, and that's very important. Thank you. Um, Fred, I'm going to ask you to think like a devil's advocate, which I suspect is something you do on a regular basis, and tell us how you think a, a defense of qualified immunity might be raised in the context of a, of a scenario like this. Well, um, first of all, the first thing I've heard is that um, it, it appeared to me that he had a weapon and that he uh, was carrying a weapon. And the loaf of bread appeared to me to be uh, a weapon. Uh, we know that that, that we saw uh, uh, Admiral Wima and um, uh, with regard to a wallet, and we've seen somebody with a comb that they thought they claim was a weapon, or someone that was actually handing over their license, and we see a person handing the license being shot in their own car. So that's the playing the devil's advocate. Uh, that would be something that I would not be surprised to hear. That the claim was that based on my view that there was a weapon that was involved in this or that this individual was running toward a baby carriage and as a result of that that there was that person was in jeopardy um, but in this situation uh, this smacks of, of uh, les miserables um, where you, you're right, the, 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 a loaf of bread. Um, you've got to deal with the facts in this case that um, is a life the value and the sanctity of a life worth a loaf of bread. 
Um, and that's really the question. But playing the devil's advocate, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that it appeared to me that he had a weapon, but it, it turns out to be, you know, a loaf of French bread. Okay, I'm going to ask a question for Steve that actually is in the chat. It's from Dwayne Bosco, who, Steve, you remember from yesterday. His question is, should there be a national guideline and protection regarding police reporting perceived unlawful activities from other officers? And so this sort of goes to the, um, to the law that John was talking about. What do you think about the idea of that being made a national standard, Steve? Well, I, th I think it's uh, it, it's something we did talk about yesterday, and and I I do agree with it. I think that there's a um, and and everyone that's done these kinds of cases knows that it's very difficult um, to get uh, other police officers to to come forward and 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 say what they saw, and understandably so because of the culture within the police force of um, you know they would be ostracized if that happened. So um, you know I think you know we have uh, not necessarily. Um, you know, national laws, because I think there's some issues on that, whether that would be constitutional to have a, a national law on that, although that I haven't really studied it, but there certainly can be local laws. And we see state laws uh, that require, uh, for instance, uh, healthcare workers to report uh, child abuse uh, when they see it. So there, there is precedent for this kind of thing. Um, but I think having uh, other police officers have a duty to come forward, uh, not only to intervene, but to say what they've seen um, I think would be a, a step in the right direction. I think it's a very difficult political thing to, uh, to, to bring forward, but I think the time is right for at least to be discussed and debated. And Steve, if I can just join in on that, the, the, the failure to intervene is also a cause of action that can be brought under 1983. And people should consider that as a method of trying to make change, like making sure that there is a uh, obligation to intervene, which is uh, put into statute and policy. So according to my clock, we are just about at the end of the formally allotted time for this program. My understanding of how the Bar Association is willing to handle this is that they were going to somehow switch us to a, a different format so we could all see each other um, and allow if people wanted to raise their hands and ask a question. Um, the um, I, I, I'm talking to see if, if that magically happens. So let's just see. In the meantime, I'm going to um, raise a question, and this is this is asking you gentlemen for a different kind of analysis. How does affiliation? with a white supreme state organization impact policing? Who wants to tackle that one? I won't tackle it, but she, she corrected that to say supremacist. I think that's, I'm sure that's what she meant, white supremacist. Um, but that's, that's you know, can, can somebody please address life as a person of color in this context, and where do we go from here? How do we, what do we do with this? Well, I think that the first thing we've got to understand is we've got to know the origins of policing. I mean, I mean, we don't have enough time for the history lesson that, that talks about police arising out of slave patrols. And, um, but if you have someone who has direct affiliation with the white supremacist organization um, and how that impacts their ability to um, be unbiased in their policing, I think that answers the question for itself. It's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in that regard. But in this situation, the real question is, how does that person remain on the force or how did they get on the force with regard to the alleged vetting that should take place prior to them becoming a police officer? I think, I think that one of the things that we have a responsibility for from a standpoint as, as members of the community is to raise all types of heck over uh, uh, situations that where that is proven. And uh, you know, from NAACP to the Black Bar Association and all others, um, and that should not be their, their fight. It should be a fight of all the persons that they are, that, that are looking for um, uh, safety and that are tr equal treatment and equity uh, in the law. If you have a police officer who is gonna treat a uh, African-American person in their custody as though that person is less than, that's exactly why Black Lives Matters is not a debate. 
it is a factual assertion that must be dealt with with a level of uh, uh, of credibility and respect because for far too long African Americans and if it's a supremacist organization are considered less than and that is not acceptable and that person um, uh, and there should be a loud cry from all corners of the community whether or not your hair is blonde or whether or not it's curled and short to your head it should be a decision that people make uh, as a community. Now, I, I note that the format for asking questions is going to be, you can't see yourselves. If you want to be unmuted, use the raise your hand feature and the Bar Association's technical person will give you access to your microphone. Um, anybody else want to comment on the pending question? And incidentally, folks, if you're here for CLE, you fulfilled your requirement. If you have something else to do at 630, the program's formally over. We just figured if people wanted to hang around, there haven't been a lot of questions. We were sort of expecting many more than we got. So we're not, this is not a quiz. We're not looking to force people to, to ask us questions. My, the, the panelists agreed to stick around if folks wanted us to. So if you don't want us to stay, we'll all happily go home. Um, but you know, if anybody has anything else burning they want to raise, this is your chance. And if anyone on the panel has anything burning they want to say. I just want to add to, to what Fred said. And, and I, I think that we have to have a universal understanding that that affiliation with a white supremacist group should be a disqualifying factor for anyone that, that serves in the police department. It's just, it just has to be. And we have to, you know, in, be unified uh, not just black people, white people, every color of people uh, of every stripe should not accept the concept that people that, that are in law enforcement can have those types of views that, that treat uh, different races in, in different ways. And that's just, I mean, and that's just obvious. And if we can't agree on that, then we can't agree on much. Duane, it looks like you're up. Oh, all right, great. Um, just a question for the panel. And uh, oftentimes as lawyers, we get caught up in the, the jury question and really doesn't focus on de facto. And de facto is where the evil lies as far as education is concerned. So my question is, where do we take the education as far as a bar organization is concerned, whatever bar you are affiliated with, uh, in regards to um, some of the deep-seated um, origination of the discrimination that permeates our systems. Um, because I was actually surprised, I consider myself a history buff, but when I took a deep dive into how insidious these things are, um, I was taken aback by it. So what type of um, educational um, uh, forums do you suggest for other bar associations to take on? Uh, Dwayne, uh, yes. good, good to see you. I'm so proud of you. I knew you when you were a law student and uh, you're one of the most outstanding lawyers in Rochester now. And uh, good to see you here at the CLE. Uh, let me say, one of the things that you can do individually is, is that police academies are always looking for speakers to speak uh, at, at their training sessions in the academy, whether it be rookies, whether it be uh, the police chiefs and supervisors. Um, I, every, every police academy class, uh, I'm an invited speaker. Every uh, police supervisors class at the Erie County Police Academy, I'm, in, I'm invited to be as a speaker. And, and I suggest in Rochester that many of you uh, just contact the, the academy and and you can just design your own program as to whatever you want to want to talk about. Uh, secondly, uh, as a bar association, uh, uh, you can propose legislation at the uh, police level, at the city level, and at the state level on criminal justice reform and, uh, and on police reform. And third, um, we need more lawyers to take on, on these cases uh, involving police abuse. Uh, there's only a few lawyers that do it, and they're expensive to take on. Uh, when you take on one of those cases to get an uh, expert for, for uh, police uh, procedures, that's going to cost about 10 grand. And then you're going to need a medical person willing to come to court and testify as well, which is probably going to be another 15 grand. So you can only afford to take so many cases. That's why you don't see um, 
people advertising on television and, and billboards saying that, you know, I take police abuse cases. They're very expensive. So th those are my ideas for it. If I can just join in that, the, the other thing is, is that um, not allowing the academies to think that they can deal with the issues of race, racism, uh, and uh, uh, biases in a four hour presentation. These are deep seated in situations. They require um, a, a level of education, not instruction mm -hmm. that, that goes a lot deeper. So the requirement that police departments say, we give four hours or we give eight hours of anti-bias training. No, there really needs to be a discussion and evaluation of the implicit biases. And then there has to be a reckoning by those individuals who are going to be police officers as to what their biases are and what they know and what they don't know. Uh, because the reality is, is that their unfamiliarity with certain communities creates a hostility within their own gut that they themselves don't know exist. So that's a real, and hopefully I'm answering your question, I think it was Dwayne, um, that that's really what has to take place. And far too often our police departments are educating superficially and not intentionally to try and deal with the culture of policing that's come about in America. So there are two interesting questions in the, in the uh, Q&A. One, and I think they in some ways may be connected. One is, do you think the quality of policing would be impacted by residency requirements for police? And the other is, is there any practical way to deal with the fact that a police officer is more likely to believe there is a risk to his or her life or safety if the person the officer is confronting is a person of color? Let me just talk about residency. Um, I think that if a police officer lives in the suburbs came to Buffalo, and um, as a requirement, they, Buffalo is one of the most segregated cities uh, in America. So they're not gonna move on the east side where all the African-Americans are. So they're, they're still gonna be segregated. Um, so, you know, so, so that, and if I could just say something about, about my experience as a police officer. Um, in 1979, I was the first African-American state trooper uh, in Syracuse, ever in Onondaga County. There were only 35 African-American state troopers in the whole state. My class doubled that, that amount. And, and what motivated me to go to law school uh, was, was the racism that I experienced. And when I got my performance evaluation, uh, I was told by, uh, by my uh, zone sergeant uh, that I needed to have a thick skin uh, because I got upset when the fellow uh, troopers used the N-word. And uh, so at that point, I decided that I worked so hard to get an undergraduate and have a great uh, GPA and all of that, that I spent uh, eight hours a day in the troop car studying for my law school admissions test so that I scored in the 95th percentile and was able to get a, a scholarship to law school. So there is, there is racism in, in, in police departments. Uh, I, you know, I mean, people, you know, it, 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 some people it's just in their nature to be in their, in their mental makeup to be racist and not accept people that are uh, that look different than them and, and other people just have a, have a different type of a brain. But um, I think policing is um, it's an occupation that draws people that have that mentality more than, than other occupations. You're going to find a greater percentage of a police officers that have racist tendencies than you are social workers or, uh, you know, nurses in a hospital or something like that. And Marie, the process of trying to thank um, Jim Nobles for his participation. He did tell us he had to leave at 640 um, and he, he scooted out before we were able to thank him. Um, any other people want to address the, the questions of either residency or, or inherent systemic racism in policing? I mean, that's a, anybody else want to talk about the elephant in the room? Um, well, no, it's, not, it's, it's actually a truism. And, and that, that's, why, that's why education is really important. 
um, because people people really need to have you have to go through the process where there's going to be some uncomfortableness. There's going to be some um, pl place where there's going to be an itch that you can't scratch, and you're really going to have to be in engaged in that conversation about what's actually taking place in the police culture and how the police culture is an us against them mentality in a lot of different ways and how that's fostered and how that's passed on um, within a police department. Whether or not it's Buffalo or Nassau County, uh, the, I mean, the, the cultures in police departments are quite different um, um, from what people think they are um, and how they talk about people is quite different than what we would think in the outward approach. And also the psychological aspects of policing um, uh, make it very difficult for us to break through some of those barriers that we call the blue wall of silence, but there's also a, uh, a wall of silence as to the fact that people know who's violent prone. Cops know that. They know who's a hot pistol. They know who's got problems with black women or, uh, or, or Hispanic men. Um, and they hear the jokes. Nobody says anything in a lot of situations and that perpetuates a culture that allows for that to happen. That's really one of the things that we really have to address is the culture of policing and how that gets turned around to serve the communities rather than occupy the communities. And I guess I can say that because I'm from Long Island and everybody else lives up in that area, so. <laughs> Um, there's a question um, that piggybacks on that, I think. It seems that lawsuits don't have the deterrent effect on individuals or departments that we always hope for, perhaps because cities indemnify the officers and qualified immunity prevents the direct impact on those who act improperly. What do you see as solutions to over-policing and excessive use of force? Psychological screening, weakening unions, elimination of qualified immunity, uh, something else, which ones do you think are most likely achievable? Steve, you want to start on that? You're muted, yeah. Steve. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just got it. Um, you know, it's it's such a it's such a broad question and such a, a big question. I, I don't um, I don't personally believe getting rid of qualified immunity is is, is the right answer, but I do think um, limiting qualified immunity is is a better way to approach it. In other words, uh, the the civil civil rights statutes originally didn't have qualified immunity. The Supreme Court wrote that in, saying that that was a common law doctrine that that was carried forward. And I think it can be redefined in a in a in a more precise way um, that I think would be helpful uh, in eliminating this. Now the the um, we we talked yesterday too about the and and uh, about contracts that are that are in place that require the unions to defend police officers under almost any circumstances um, and that you know the, the the police unions obviously uh, are an impediment to the cities and the municipalities getting rid of bad officers um, it's unfortunate I mean I think that unions serve a, a great purpose in this country but it's true that that there's a lot of and and you know Fred I'm sure has has stories to tell about the officers that that had uh, you know that were uh, had histories of of abuse that that stayed on the force for many years because um, the unions kept them on and and the the, uh, the authorities the administration couldn't do anything so we we need to to do some I think legislation around that for sure uh, to make it easier for municipalities to uh, to release officers who are troublemakers who are that hot pistol who do those things. And I mean, there's a lot of, of that, um, you know, the, the, when you have these cases, you find that, that the people that are involved in them usually have a past. It's not, you know, they're not, they're, they're kind of like, you know, not one-time actors. They've, they've got a history of that. And, uh, and, and we have to, you know, we have to eliminate, uh, I don't think civil lawsuits are the best way to do that. Um, but I think that we have to allow the administration to, to act and, um, it is good in a sense, there is a feedback, in other words, that if there are financial losses to the municipality due to, you know, to the same officer over and over again, hopefully that is a deterrent in some sense, but it's, it's sort of an indirect deterrent and, and sometimes it gets lost in the, in the weeds. Uh, John, were you, were you going to comment? Uh, no. Okay. Well, uh, I, I, 
qualified, I call qualified immunity, quantified impunity. Um, and uh, I think qualified immunity is a creation of the courts. Uh, it is not statutory, nor is it codified. Um, and it's become a, a problem. So I think that it really needs to be a close look at the eradication or, and or at least some, some, some uh, limiting with regard to qualified uh, immunity. Um, uh, the, the lawsuits are not um, the deterrent. They are a punishment sometimes to the municipality, but many times they are slow to change because there's so much money invested from PBAs into political campaigns. And we need to talk about that. We need to really just talk about the influence of PBAs um, and contributions on people that are running for office. And that's an uncomfortable conversation by politicians because they don't wanna be on the wrong side of law enforcement. But in some situations we should talk about whether or not a police union who's gonna to have to bargain for their contract can make major contributions to people that are gonna be voting on those contracts. Um, and with regard to some of the changes that are taking place, um, one of the things may very well be requiring police officers uh, to purchase their own liability insurance um, and um, have that purchased by the uh, municipality, have the police officers pay the, the premium based on their actions. So if a police officer does not get involved in things, they're covered. But if indeed there's a, they start getting involved in over and over again, the premiums go up, that they're required to do that. That then puts some weight on the police officers themselves to purchase their own liability insurance in addition to the indemn indemnification. That may very well help to change some minds. There are many, many questions that are out there that are being talked about now. And down on Long Island, we put out a people's plan that talks about some of those things that, that can serve as deterrence. But the reality is, is that the government has to want to change. And if they don't want to change, they're not gonna push it um, because uh, far too often police unions have a stronghold on a lot of aspects of who makes decisions and how decisions are made. You're, you're, you're muted. All right, there are two questions left. I'm going to read the first one. Um, the first one is, we have not discussed bias in both grand and petty juries. Um, my experience is that jurors tend to believe police officers and are reluctant to attribute ill motives to them. Is that consistent with the um, experience that you gentlemen have, have found? There you go. I like to be in state court rather than federal court because I have an opportunity to question the prospective jurors in voir dire. And one of the things that a lot of lawyers don't do that people should do is use focus groups before you try the case and, and, and understand how the, the potential jurors think about your case so that you can identify those jurors based upon their profiles that you get from your focus group as to which ones are gonna have those type of biases and then develop a plan uh, so that, that those jurors, I kind of call them rats, but that you can get those rat killing questions uh, so that they can be, be challenged uh, for cause and, then, and, and, and your, your, your chances of getting an unbiased juror uh, jury is a little bit in, in your control because you can identify and pick out the ones that are so pro-police that you're not going to get a fair trial. But a lot of the background information you can get by doing a focus group. And Steve wanted to say something. Yeah, I think in addition to that, um, uh, I think uh, detailed jury questionnaires to the extent that you can ever get a judge to agree to it. And we've had quite a bit of success of that uh, in doing that, and especially in complex cases. But jurors tend to, to give themselves away much more uh, freely in a questionnaire format than they do in when they're uh, in, in a crowd of people and they don't want to say something controversial, but they'll They'll, they'll express themselves much more on paper. So to the extent that you can get a, a juror questionnaire, I think it's really helpful. I mean, you know, the, there are biases toward police officers, but there are biases in, in every direction of jurors. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of case, there's gonna be jurors on there that are gonna not like your case just because 
they don't, and not because of any of the facts of the case or your client. So, you know, juror questionnaires can be really helpful in, in weeding those people out uh, and giving them a, you know, sort of an opportunity to, to speak freely without having to say it in front of the whole crowd. And I found them uh, very helpful. Not that I can weed out everyone because no one can, uh, but I think juror questionnaires are really helpful. And, and even the federal judges, especially in complex cases, will will typically at least listen to you on that, even though they don't want to spend a minute doing voir dire. Um, they will sometimes give you a, a, a an opportunity to do a questionnaire, which, again, if you're not going to do voir dire, it's 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 almost vital to have that. Fred, if you want to comment, and then, you know, it, it, it is nine minutes to seven, and I think we ought to let everybody go. So I'm giving you the last word, Mr. Brewington. That's what that we're courteous to people from downstate. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, uh, I am a very appreciative, and it's so wonderful to be on, on, on the panel with, with uh, such illustrious counsel. Um, and I, I agree that, that the, um, the selection of, of jurors is key uh, in, in, all, in, in all cases. But uh, in these cases, particularly because trying to root out who uh, has a bias, uh, no matter how um, hidden it is with regard to police, uh, one way or the other is important. Um, it's interesting because John prefers state court uh, for reasons, um, but uh, the, perhaps the bench is a little different down here in the Southern and Eastern District. Um, so we, we prefer federal court for most of our 1983 stuff based on the fact that the judges are actually um, more willing to and open uh, to uh, open discovery and other things. So it depends on your jurisdiction. But I agree with both Steve and John, and that's my last word, and I'm sticking to it. So I want to thank everybody. There are questions pending, folks. You, all of these um, lawyers and Mr. Nobles have provided contact information. I urge you to reach out to people directly if there's stuff you wanna raise with them. But thank you all. It's been a pleasure working with these wonderful panelists. It's been a stimulating conversation and good night. Thanks, Anna Marie, you did a great right. job. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.